So this, well, well, this is, if on the one hand, about Bradley Manning, it's about much bigger principles at play here. You know, I, I have spent a lot of time with the family of Anwar al laki and Abdul Rahman al laki And I always try to tell the story of what happened to Abdul Rahman al laki the 16-year-old kid who was blown up two weeks after his father was killed. He wasn't with his father. He hadn't seen him in years. He was a kid who, who, who was a normal teenager being raised by his grandparents who are upstanding people uh, who were not Anwar al laki uh, they wanted a different life for their grandson. And when the kid turned 16, he decided to run away because he wanted to, to look for his father. And he didn't find his father. His father was killed nowhere near where he went to look for him. And he got stuck in the south of Yemen in his family's village because of the uprising that was happening at the time in the so-called Arab Spring. There was an uprising against the U.S. backed dictatorship in Yemen. The roads were closed. There was fighting. So he had to stay there. And he's out having dinner one night when a drone appears above him and his cousin Ahmed, who was 17, and other teenagers from their tribe. And, and a missile was fired and blew them up. The US government has never provided an explanation as to why that kid was killed. Uh, I was told by a former senior White House official who was involved with the targeting program at the highest level that John Brennan, the current director of the CIA, believed that it could not have been a coincidence, that it must have been an intentional hit on Abdul Rahman al -Laki. perhaps because there was false intel fed that he was 21 or that he was connected to Al-Qaeda. Uh, but the, the person that they said they were trying to kill in that strike, Ibrahim al -Bana, is still alive. When Robert Gibbs, the White House, former White House press secretary, was asked about the killing of Abdul Rahman al he said he should have had a more responsible father. There are a few things more shameful in life than blaming the killing of a child on who their parents are. Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader, said of Anwar al laki Samir Khan, the other American that was killed with Anwar al laki and Abdul Rahman al laki If there were three Americans who deserved to be killed, it was those three. And when I sought to get an answer from his office on why Abdul Rahman al laki the 16-year-old, deserved to be killed, they refused to provide a, an answer. How you treat the most reprehensible of your citizens in a society says a lot about who you are. And, 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 and if we now are at a, a, a phase in our history where we just fast forward past the part where you present evidence against people and you start sentencing them to death without even charging them with a crime, then stop portraying your nation as this shining city on a hill. You know, and say, well, we actually, for some, in some cases, we believe that we should round up the mob, get the pitchforks, and go and met out citizens' justice against these people. I, I'm not naive, so naive has to believe, or not believe, that there are active plots to blow up American airplanes. Of course there are. But the, the threat posed by international terrorism against the United States and against Americans in general doesn't even rank in the top 10 threats facing us as a society. That we, have, we have reacted out of fear. We have allowed the government under both Republicans and Democrats to push back our civil liberties and our rights in the name of our safety. It's an Orwellian moment that we're living in. And, and, and you know, I, I've been traveling a lot around the country and, and, and talking to people, and I've heard from so many folks in the military community. I was approached by another former member of JSOC when I was on the West Coast, and he recently got out of He was on the kinetic side, but he was an operator. And, and I can't share the full details of what he said to me, but he wrote me a, an email after we met. And he, or he sent it to me and I guess the NSA, but he wrote me an email after we met and he said, I've known too many people that have died and who I've killed. And I can't do it anymore. And some of us need to start speaking out. It would be incredible if people within the special operations community who have been, as they say on the tip of the spear, but really running this whole high-value targeting campaign, as they call it, if some of them actually started to say, to tell stories of what they did, um, and how it's affected them as people, because it also, that's how it affects us as a society. And the final thing I'll say is this, you know, I, um, I think all of us watch the, um, the aftermath of these school shootings and the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, and related to the victims. You know, I mean, it's incredible when these horrifying incidents happen, the, the gut-wrenching stories of who the people were that were killed, you know, and the and heroes. You know, some of these school shootings, teachers trying to block their students in doors or, or getting them into a closet, risking their 
own lives and some of them being killed doing it. And the eight-year-old boy you know, who was killed in the Boston Marathon bombing with that beautiful picture that he had uh, painted that went all over Facebook. And you know, I've been thinking a lot about that in, in the context of some of the images that we have in our film. You know, if, you, if you see our film, there's a lot of child, faces of children. Um, and there's this one image that really haunts me um, and I think about every day. It was this little girl that I met in El Modula, and her, her family had been wiped out in that first time that President Obama authorized a strike against Yemen. And we went there and interviewed the, some of the survivors of it. And we, we videotaped this little girl, and uh, she didn't say anything, she was just staring. And in her eyes, if you look closely at it, you can see a reflection of me and Rick Rowley, our director, pointing a camera at her. And I often wonder, what, what, who does she think we are? She's never met an American before. She's only met American missiles. Um, who, who are we to her? Uh, what painting did she do last week? You know, or did she do the week before her parents were blown up? Uh, well, what, if, what if her story was known in this country? Uh, people knew her name. Now, my, my, my assignment for all of us, and I've tried to take this on myself too, and it's a, it's a small thing to do and it's so easy to do, but I think it would be profound if we all started doing it. To know the story of someone who's been killed in a drone strike uh, or in a botched night raid, and the next time someone uses the term collateral damage, in you, tell them that story. Make it real. The way that it's real when our own people are killed in school shootings or the Boston Marathon bombing. Because the reason why we all feel so horrified at these incidents is because we empathize. We see the humanity of the victims. We own them as our own in some way, and we say, that could have been my daughter or my son or my brother or my father that was, was killed. I, I, I was, I'm haunted. Uh, haunted by an inability to stop, uh, to stop this and um, feel most comfortable with people that I meet and have the opportunity to, to tell the stories of. And uh, you, know, you come back here and it's like no one cares. It's, it, it's, it's incredible. And I, I know soldiers feel that way too, but maybe in a different universe. But you just feel like no one's paying any attention to this. And everyone's just sort of whistling past the graveyard. And um, so I don't, I don't know where else to go with that, but it just, uh, you know, it, I've been criticized recently. People are saying, oh, you're not an objective journalist. You're damn right I'm not an objective journalist. I've never pretended to be. There's no, the objectivity is bullshit. There's no such thing as that. You think the New York Times is an objective newspaper? It's not an objective. There's, you, have, you have the most activist journalists in the country are the ones that are statists, you know, that are just stenographers for the lies of administrations. And, um, and I, I, I think you know, we're not robots as journalists. Um, you know, if, you, if you stop caring, or you stop carrying around the stories of the dead and the living that you've encountered, then you're, you're, you're not human. And I think that that's part of the problem with our sanitized media culture. So. And so, you know, as I said at the beginning, I don't have answers on this. But what, what, I, what, I, what I want to spend these years doing that are coming is, is trying to encourage a confrontation of the national security state. Uh, and to have, finally have a debate in this country. What, what does national security even mean? What does it look like? Are we creating more new enemies than we are killing terrorists? I, I, would like, I would like to hear the government, someone in the government, answer that question and back it up with evidence or facts. Because I heard from people in Yemen and Somalia, Afghanistan and elsewhere, the exact same thing. You say that Al-Qaeda is terrorism. Okay, we agree with you. But your drones are terrorism to us. I have met people who said, after the Americans raided our home in Afghanistan and killed my pregnant wife and then dug the bullets out of her body in front of me before sending me off for three days of interrogations only to realize that you had killed the wrong people, I wanted to put a suicide vest on and blow myself up among the Americans. We are going to pay for these policies. There will be blowback. It will make us less safe as a society. I, I don't take any of this lightly. This, we are at a very serious moment at home and abroad, but we're also at a moment where finally there's a little bit of a crack in the armor, an opportunity to have that discussion and we should make it so. In these wars, the war doesn't end just because the troops came out of it. It doesn't end for the Rockies, it's not gonna end for Afghans, it certainly doesn't end for us as veterans. And so our Right to Heal campaign, I, I love it if you went to uh, righttoheal.org and we're, we're doing it in conjunction 
with several organizations in Iraq, the Center for Constitutional Rights here, we're actually filing uh, a court brief uh, to try and hold the U.S. government accountable for the human rights violations that it has caused both against U.S. service members as well as Iraqis and Afghans. Uh, and hopefully as, as we begin to expand that network and also maybe uh, folks like Rouge from Miami and, and others. So just really encourage you to check out uh, iBW.org, check out uh, RightsToGive.org, and look at the work that's continuing to ongoing. Our members are going to continue to tell our stories, but we're also organizing our community of veterans and service members uh, against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and around the world.